Thanks everyone for coming. Um, our two people from the online audience and the rest here in person. I hope you guys can hear me. And I will just say a quick thank you to our sponsors. So that's the School of Computing and Mathematical Sciences for the room tonight and the New Zealand Open Source Society for sponsoring the Big Blue Button instance that we're actually running our virtual meeting on and also the recording. And hopefully tomorrow I will have a rendering and I can turn that once again into uh, a YouTube video and then post it on Meetup as well. So people who um, haven't been able to attend or had to leave early or just want to rewatch exciting bits, um, they can do that then later on. So tonight will be a mathematical theme to it. Um, it's going to be a little bit, so don't worry, it's not going to be too bad, so it's not going to go too deep, I think. Um, it's more about the joy of using Python for doing some mathematical bits and pieces. And uh, Ian will start off as the first presenter today. Good on, thanks Peter. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, I'm just going to, uh, oh, well I, I stumbled upon a, a um, a particular piece of number theory, and uh, I'll demo that. And then I, I looked up another one. There's there's a lots of um, uh, uh, what number theories out there. If if uh, you want to play around and, and get Python to to execute them, um, one of the things that I reckon works well with Python is that you can um, stay with integers. Um, you don't. Um, if you if you just use the operators like addition, subtraction, multiplication, the integer divide, modulo, or exponent slash power, then if you put integers in, you'll get integers out, right? It's not till you do something like do a floating point divide, and and you've got um, say four divided by three that you come out with a floating point number. And if you do integer mathematics on Python, then there's really no limit to the size of the numbers, and 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 the accuracy is 100%. Whereas when when you start getting into floating point, you you can have inaccuracies and things. Um, another thing with so yeah, I think those are the main um, operators that that will if you feed integers into them, you'll get integers out. And there's also other things you can do with an integer. Like rearrange the order of the digits, or you know, do some sort or reverse sort the digits in an integer, um, and you can also put integers into a list and sort them. And at no point do they get um, does the integer get uh, well, uh, get converted into a float. So that's perhaps the beauty of it. So when when I the little programs we look at tonight, um, they they basically stay with um, integers. <laughs> and I never get into a float. Uh, yeah, I think that's true. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to um, first demo uh, Caprica's constant or routine. Um, it was from a D, Mr. Dr. Caprica, who was a recreational mathematician. I think a school teacher by by profession. Um, he's I don't know if he might have got his hands on a computer if he died in 1986, I think at age 81 or something. Um, yeah, so, but otherwise he might have worked it all out by by hand. And uh, 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 there's a couple of links to, to his routine. So we'll just have a little look at it. Um, the routine he came up with is, is a iterative algorithm uh, with each iteration. You take a natural number in any given base, and in my case, I'll take base 10. It must have at least two distinct digits. So you can't have um, 1111, you have to have at least, say, 112, or something like that. So there's two distinct digits within the number. And you create uh, two new numbers oh, yeah, by sorting the digits of the number by descending and ascending order. And then you subtract the second from the first to yield the natural number for the next iteration. So in, if we've got in base 10, the number 164, if we sort it descending, the digits in the integer, 164, we get 641. And if we set, uh, sort it in ascending order, 
we get 146. And then if we set, subtract 146 from the number 641, we get 495, which is all very, all very interesting. Um, so what? Well, the next thing is, having got 495, what would happen if we did this again? So let's go to the next page, you see? And we see 495 in descending order is nine, oops, a typo here. <laughs> It's just me. No, it's five, four. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. I, I can show my program won't make that mistake. And uh, in ascending order, four, five, nine. And when we you subtract them, if they're correct, we've got four, nine, five again. So in other words, we're now looping. So um, with three digits, a three-digit integer, um, after a certain number of iterations, it will always come to 495 okay so if you don't believe me you've got pretty good grounds <laughs> i'll show you well, yeah, that was an impossibility for cats. <laughs> yeah um yeah which one okay Let, let's start with, what the number did i have 164 is it uh, what was the one i had before yeah 164 okay well, let's put that in and see what he produces. Okay. On the first iteration, the range descending 641, ascending 146, and we get 495. And then if we put 495, we get 954, 459. The next time through, we get um, uh, we get 495 again. Okay. So that that's my little program demonstrating it. And if we put in at the other end of the scale, what did I suggest here? Put in 100, okay. So if I change this and I put in 100, uh, it'll whiz off the screen a bit, so we'll have to go back. So here's the first iteration, 100 minus 001 is 99. Then we put in 99 um, descending and 99 ascending, and we get that, and then the third iteration, the fourth iteration, the fifth iteration, sixth iteration, we get 495. Yeah, okay. And if we put the 495 in again, we get 495. Okay. And um, what did I have? Ah, the, there were there was one rule that we can't have all the numbers the same. So if I put in 4444, four, 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 um, zero iterations to reach the repeating zero zero zero. So you can't. That's kind of the one rule. Is you can't you can't put that in. And um, always gone to zero. Yeah. And if yeah, and four because of you, when you arrange ascending and descending, it's the same number. So you can't subtract. Well, when you subtract, you get that. And if you put four nine five, it whoops. Oh, hang on. Oh, it's just one. It, it doesn't really iterate. It just Go straight into it. Okay, so that works with three digit numbers. I'll just go back to my presentation. Uh, okay, and oh, what happens if we go to four digit numbers? So in this case, I put in 2060, and when you rearrange descending, 6200, rearrange ascending, 0026, and you get 6174. And if you then do the same with 6174, is 7641, 1467, and seven, uh, 6174. So the four digit um, iterating um, goes into a loop by hitting the number 6174. Okay, and in fact, July, I'll just go back to my little program and we'll put in. What did I say? Two zero six zero or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here, here it went through, and by the, after the first time through, it was at six one seven four. If I put in say um, two thousand, okay, took four iterations. So if we go here. We put in two thousand. Um, yeah, first number we get nineteen ninety eight, and then the next one eighty eighty two, and then. 85.32, and that one comes to 6174. Okay. Um, 
So that's the magic number for four, four digit. Um, oh, I'll just carry on a bit. Um, yeah, if you look at the, the three digit numbers, this is the, the kind of the tree of how they all end up with, on the top right hand corner, you've got 495. Okay, so um, if I have a number that ends in 5, 15, or 25, in that top box there, then um, with there's 148 of those sorts of numbers between 100 and 999, and they will they will get to 495 in one iteration. Get me? Does that sound right? Um, we're, and 495 will will go will loop on itself. What's the 990? Oh, maybe that's. I don't know what the, num the other the blue numbers are exactly. Whereas if I'm over here with a number like 100, 100, zero, zero, um, then it, it goes to 99, and then it goes to 891, to there, to there, to there, to there. So that's like one, two, three, four, five, six iterations before it gets to 495. But they all get there within six iterations. And if Interesting it's, that all the numbers are divisible by nine, and the middle digit is the sum of the other digits. Well, all those are the uh, diagonal. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, there's two. Mm. <laughs> okay. And you've got 360 yeah. Mm. So all the all... Apparently this guy, it was his hobby kind of thing, and the... Uh, in fact, the old ones are 99. 99 will divide all those. Yeah. Because the old ones will be 11 as well. Yeah. There is a tree also for the one that ends up with 6174, but it, I thought it would, you wouldn't be able to read it. It's a bit it's a bit crowded. Um, this, this is on the Wikipedia page, actually, where I stole that from. But, um, 6174 also is So in base n, are the Caprica numbers always divisible by n minus one? Yeah, I haven't tried it now, writing another basis. But um, oh, one of the things when when I wrote this is um, I basically treated the numbers as a string because you type in a string and and, and it, it gives you the number, right? And uh, the only thing you have to do you, you manipulate and create two other strings, right? You manipulate that original string to have a descending order and ascending order and then there's the only bit of mathematics is one subtraction has to be done so that's where i convert the two strings to integer and um and, and that's the only time i actually go to to integer uh i go yeah convert from strings to um integers and do the calculation then i go back to strings in fact i z fill it so that if the answer was say one i would go zero zero one so I, I paid it the front. Um, yeah. Anyway, what, what was the I don't know why I was telling you that. But, um, Do you know whether it has a, has a, a different behavior if you use numbers to a different base? Like if you're using octal numbers, for example. Yeah. Or, or does it do the same sort of thing, but uh, with different values? Yeah. It would be the same sort of thing, but it won't be the same this number. Right. In fact, in the Wikipedia page, there's a lookup. It, 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 there's a table there, and it says base 10, three digits is 495, four digits is 6174, five digits is nothing or something, six digits is it's some other ones, right? So it gives you all the numbers, and then it'll say for base 8. Perhaps I can find the Wikipedia page from them. So what I was wondering was if those numbers are converted, say, to the decimal base, do you end up with the same? 495 value, or in fact, they have their own costs each, each number. Yeah, they're right, I think. Yeah, right. Yeah, so yeah, the base 8 one wouldn't convert to 495. Yeah. Um, anyway, let's, I can't remember what my slides are. What's next? Ah, I, I've mentioned that. Is that um, the way I did it was I kept all the data as a string, so it was easy to reverse and, and um, sort. Ascending, sort, descending, sort of thing, and um, and then I just change it to an integer subtraction. 
But on the Wikipedia page, they do it where they stay, keep everything in um, in as integer. So you put the number in, and immediately they convert. I type in a number, which is a string, and it's immediately converted to an integer, and then they just stay doing integer maths. Yeah. Um, I thought my code was more efficient. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> Here's some examples of. See, I bring in the st string. Um, you can you can put a string into a list, um, and then uh, so that's what your list looks like. You want to split it up. Um, another way I, I've stumbled upon this, where you, if you want to put a string to a list, you can just put bracket colon zero, right bracket, and that will convert that string into a list one two three four. You familiar with that one? I didn't know that. But you've got to define it first. You've got to, you've got to go int list equals bracket bracket, right? And then int list bracket colon zero bracket equals one, two, three, four. We'll make a list. Anyway, that's, I thought that was kind of cute. Um, How obvious. No, I don't understand how it works. <laughs> I think the list in parentheses is string is far more obvious. Over this one, yeah. over this side, yeah. The other thing um, looks more like magic. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, and then what was another one? You can, uh, once it's in a string, you can sort ascending, yeah, or um, you can do a sort reverse equals true and get sort descending. Um, and over here, what do we got? Oh, yeah. oh, you can use sorted. Oh, no, that's sorted. Yeah. Yeah. And then having made a string as a, a, a list, rather, you can join it all back up and, and get get a string back. So that's that way. Um, One time you were saying, Peter, I'm trying to remember with join, what you put, is it list.join separated or separated on another? Yeah. List? Yeah, that is. It took me a long time. It's a bit confusing, that one, isn't it? But, well, bear in mind that you want to produce a string. Oh, okay. And a string is kind of like a list to me as well. So. Yeah, but it can be any sequence, like, it can be any iterator. Yeah. If you think about it that way, the only constant is yeah, the string. Yeah. So it's got to be the string. Yeah. Anyway, um, so to reverse a list, int list reverse, reverse is. Um, as a method, and this is the old colon colon minus one. That's sort of generally known as for reversing a string. Um, okay, so if I go back to my, um, see the trouble with the Python's hot open convention. You know, when you do an ascending query, you specify the lower bound, and then one past the upper bound. It doesn't work so nicely in reverse. Um, if I just take this off and go boom, then it um, it gives me all the ones. From, I start at 100 and go to 9,999. So this is the number of iterations that number six, six, five, four, three, one, two, and each time it gets to um, four, 495, except when it's all the integers are the same digit. So 111 will immediately go to zero. So we can go through those. You can see how many iterations, but it, I don't think there's any time when it gets to seven when I've only got three digits. And if we scroll on down. What about two digits? Digits don't work, I don't think. There's nothing. Oh. And then here we go. A thousand takes five iterations to get to 6174. All right, and we get some, take seven iterations to get to 6174. Uh, yeah. Anyway, that's kind of a cute little bit of number theory. Um, so I think unless there's more questions, um, I'll go on to my next little one, which is... Oh, damn. One more. Where was it? Okay. 
Oh, is that shifted from this to here? Okay. Okay. And then I found another little number theory sequence, which is, if I can get my tongue around it, narcissistic number. It's also known as a pluperfect digital invariant or an Armstrong number or a plus perfect number. And Michael F. Armstrong, who, who recently is no longer with us, he probably got his hands on a computer because he taught computer science. He was an American mathematician. Um, yeah, so he might have been able to get a computer to help him. Oh, sorry. Okay, so this guy, Mr. Armstrong, he was playing around with some numbers one day. And he looked at numbers where if you look at a, a number and it's, say, got three digits, then if you want to take the, the first, second, and third digits and all raise them all to the power of three. And, for example, if you take the number 153, one to the power of three is one, um, five to the power of three is 125, and three to the power of three is 127, and they all end up to 153. So he calls that his Armstrong number or his, I don't know who came up with a narcissistic number, but um, whatever name you want to give it. And apparently there are only 89 of these numbers um, in base 10 anyway, um, of which the largest number is uh, that number, which has 39 digits. And um, so what's the one? So where is the... Apparently if you get to... Once you get to 60 or more, it becomes impossible. You know, like mathematically, you can prove that it would be impossible to ever have a narcissistic number higher. So, so that's why. Yeah, so this would be 1 to the power of 39 times 1. To, we'll, we'll, we'll do that shortly. And, and, uh, zero, so you just put it in zero. Um, uh, and oh, again, good old Wikipedia actually gave me a um, uh, a bit of code there, and and they um, kept it all as uh, as integers. Uh -huh. I do it the back one. It's mm -hmm. easier. Yeah. So they they were do, doing this, and and I I again went back to using a string because I could use length to get the the digital count, the number of digits in the in my um, number, right? And okay, so if we go to demo narcissistic, um, I think I'll go to the next one here. Okay, oh, it's still going. Um, I'm I'm going from one to ten million, and um, it takes about um, well, on this computer uh, about 26 seconds or something like that so I'll be finished in a minute so we're up to 4 million that might 23 mm, well 28 seconds okay um, so I'll just go back to the beginning of that um, so from narcissistic numbers from one to nine, they're all narcissistic, right? <laughs> and, and then, or oh, zero, I guess, as, as well. So that's the first 10. And then that 153 um, that I talked about, and then uh, 370 comes up, and um, uh, 371, then 407, and and so on. They start to really spread out after that. Um, I think if I just get back to my slideshow. Um, oops, what did that happen? Yeah, I just did some timing on this computer when it wasn't uh, running so harsh. And if I just go from zero to one million, it takes two seconds and it finds 21 of those numbers. If I go from zero to 10 million, it takes 26 seconds. That's what you just saw. And it found 25. Mm -hmm. I think. 100 million takes nearly five minutes. 300 be five minutes. It found 28. And then I get up to just about an hour to, to find it, to do the first billion. 
So I don't know how to, quite how long it would take me to um, find that one. <laughs> find that one. Whoops. What's C almost linear? Um, if I just grab that number. Now, I've got a, yeah, this one here, enter number, put that in, and it says it's an Armstrong number. And just so I'm not, you know, I'm not cheating too much. <laughs> you have a number in there. You have all 80 numbers, 89 numbers stored in there. <laughs> That's a <visual> program. <laughs> I have um, 402 is not. But what surprised me when I went to test this, and I put the number in, I thought, oh, whoops, I'll subtract one and make it that. And, you know, that should prove that, that, that my program's working because one less is surely not an Armstrong number, but it, but it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you actually got to go to um, 399. <laughs> Considering it was spaced out there, let's, let's <laughs> yeah. find them too, the next to each other. Yeah, the last two. But 370 and 371 are mm -hmm. also, um, so it's just the difference, you know, if, I think probably anything that ended in a zero, the ne if it's the next one's a one, it'll... Again, that's base 10. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, um, as always, yeah. Yeah, it can be done on other bases too. I think if, if you want to get into more narcissism or whatever, then, um, yeah, you can go to another base. Um, okay, and then my last little one is playing with prime numbers. Um, I wrote a little prime number locator uh, as a Takinta program many years ago, actually, and some of it was, was more just to a way of um, testing different CPU speeds. So I just knew that if I ran it on this computer, it took this long, ran it on another computer, it took so long, and, and gave me just a, a rough idea of how, how fast it was. So my little program has different ways of doing, uh, finding prime numbers. Um, one is to just um, skip even numbers. Um, and it's, I call it excessively recursive. I think I just keep going right up. If I have to find, um, let's say I've, I've got to the number 100, then I'd start at 2, and I tried dividing 2 into it, 3 into it, 4 into it, and go right up to 99, which is impossible. Mm -hmm. You only need to go halfway. You know, the square root. The square root. Yeah. Know, but, yeah. So it's up to 10, right? Yeah. Um, the other way is, one way of finding prime numbers is using modulo 6, and a prime number will either be, if you've done a modulo 6 on a number, the prime number can, uh, and you, you've got a one or a five, then that potentially could be a prime number. I think is a, or, or all all prime numbers are modulo six, one and five numbers. Well, of course, because modulo three is divisible by three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if it's zero, two, or four, then it's divisible by two. Yeah, so it, it what, so you can just do a get a number, do a modulo modulo six on it and um if you get zero two three four throw it out uh, and get get the next number because you know it wasn't a prime um well do you know the civil veritosthenes pardon the civil veritosthenes it's it's a way of generating the primes you you write up all the numbers from one to n and then what or from two to n so uh, so throw out one mm. Uh, and then the, fir the first number that's left is a prime, in this case two. Then what you do is you throw out every multiple of it. Uh, uh, four, six, eight, and so on. And what's left is three, that's a prime. Then you throw out all the multiples of that. Six you've already thrown out, nine throw out, twelve already thrown out. Yes. So, so four you already throw out when you throw out multiples of two. So the next one is five, and so on. Uh -huh. Just for added value, spawn a new process every time you get a new prime. And then you feed all the remaining numbers through. So each time you get a new prime, you get a new stage in the pipeline, and it, it filters out all multiples of itself. It passes across the first one, mm -hmm. and then it filters out all multiples of that. So every time you find a new prime, you start a new process. That process has the more limited. 
Yeah. And then right, right at the back. <laughs> <laughs> then um, minimal recursion means I went for the square root. I only went up to the square root of the yeah. number. And then I found there's a, a library called Sim, Simpy. Simpy. And in, in, it, in it, you can have prime range. And you can make the prime range just to get that particular integer and, and, and tell me, is it prime? Or you can put in, you can come back with a list, or either one come back with a list. Um, so anyway, I'll just demo my, my little prime number locator. Um, the show command will factor. Um, is that? Oops, I'll just hide that. I'll just clear the screen a bit. Eh? Um, it says it uses a quadratic set method. Call your tools. Google call your tools includes a program called Factor. Um, to just make it to take a bit of time, the, these are the different ways I've got. One, two, I've actually got six different ways of of calculating primes or getting a um, getting the prime. So I'll start from a million and 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 ask for five hundred. Ask for a hundred uh, from a million to a million one hundred and and get all the primes that are in that range. Right. Okay. So if I say click the OK, I've got this four seconds, five, six. Okay. So th there's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Primes that found, and it took 6.15. So, um, yeah, my my program's pretty slow. So we'll try another one. This is where we're going to skip the even numbers only, um, and we go okay. That and it whizzes across a bit faster, and it does it in 3.1. Okay, and if we clear that again, and now I'll do the modulo six. So that'll clear things out. It should clear things out even faster. And down to 2.2. 2. Um, now I'll do the uh, square root. So I minimise the amount of recursion I'm doing. And that was <laughs> 0 0.0923. So that sort of helps it along a bit. Um, just, what is that? 0, 0.93 seconds. Like one second. Yeah, um, and if I, if I go SimPy where I'm looping so that I can have a gas gauge, basically most of my CPU time will be spent making the gas gauge, I think. So we clear that and do it. Oh, that's, oh, okay, it was a little bit slow. But if I say to SimPy, just give it to me as a, um, as a list, <laughs> and I think Simpy, looking at the code, I think it uses Muller Rubin, something like the Muller Rubin method of calculating primes or something. But I don't understand. Mr. Muller Rubin was a bit, bit over the top of my head. Yeah. So I think that's about it for. Me playing with numbers. I don't think there's anything more in my with my presentation. I'll just see if I have anything more. Let me go with my last slide. Right? Yeah. Okay. So um, maybe we'll move on. And uh, who's who wants to? Well, thank you. Ian. It's all right. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs>
this is an infinite thing here, but this thing down here is an exact copy of the whole expression. Right? Can you see that? You can see that like that. This is exactly the same as the whole thing. So we can simplify this thing down to x equals 1 over x, which is something we can solve to an exact number. So let's go oops, um, here. And uh, so if you remember anything about your high school maths, you multiply both sides by x. So first of all, let's move the 1 onto that side. So x minus 1 is 1 over x. Then we multiply both sides by x, and we get this thing here. And if you remember anything about quadratic equations, I think remember Ian showed the formula for solving a quadratic equation. Now that x minus b plus 4 and all that. Now there's a simpler way to solve that. There's a thing called completing the square, which is a technique which is, I think, much more. So you look at this. Um, if, if you look at this minus x term here, that's twice of minus a half. And minus a half squared is a quarter. So let's see if we add one quarter to both sides and get this. Right? So x squared minus x plus a quarter, and that's it, you get one plus a quarter. And what's so special about that? That left side can be factorized into x minus a half times x minus a half. So if x times x is x squared, x times minus a half is minus half x. Then this times this is another minus a half x, which is your minus x. And this part times this part is a quarter. So if we take the square root of both sides, we get this. From which x is equal to that. X can be square roots can be plus or minus, remember. So the positive answer is this number, 1.618. And the negative answer, actually, of course, because that that series there is only positive numbers, so it can't have a negative answer. But the negative answer look is very similar to positive. Now, anybody recognize this number? This is called the golden ratio. The golden ratio, square root of 5 plus 1 over 2 is 1.618. So, if you, some interesting properties, right? If you subtract 1 from it, it's the same as 1 over it. So, 1.618 minus 1 is 0 0.618, which is 1 over 1.618. And the golden ratio has this, it pops up in nature a lot. The ancient Greeks knew it as a particularly pleasing kind of thing. You know how a lot of oh, widescreen TVs are 16 by 9, and uh, for many years, computer monitors have also become 16 by 9. But now, um, lately, people are discovering 16 by 10 or 8 by 5 monitors. And 8 by 5, 8 divided by 5 is 1.6, which is less than, what is it, oh, less than 1% different from 1.618. So people are discovering that monitor ratios in the ratio of this ratio are particular are nicer to work with than 16 by 9. So this is a interesting number. And uh, down here, so I'm using, I thought, to get a lot of precision, I thought I'd use the Python decimal module, which is, which gives you a lot more Ian was talking about integer arithmetic to arbitrary precision, and Python floats are your normal IEEE 754 float, so you only get about 15 figures for double precision. But Python's decimal module, because it's completely software-based, it works with a fixed precision, but that fixed precision can be any value you want. So what I did here was I set the precision to 64 decimal places, 64 decimal digits. Why not? Yeah. Seems work. Just for fun, just for fun, you know? I mean, it seems to work okay. The speed's all right, you know? I mean, the default is like 30 or something, which is, ah, boring, 30. Who, who, who needs 30 digits as child's play? So what I've done, uh, so this, I'll use this for displaying stuff down here. Now, what I've done here is I've written a function which will generate LaTeX for a continued fraction expressed as a list of numbers. So the B0, A1, B1, A2, which is from here. So this will generate the format there. So, uh, and then I also have a function down here, which will evaluate. Now, uh, let's see how I can go over it. Uh, so yeah, we were talking about backslash frac, I think earlier. Mm -hmm. 
So this is how I do fractions in later. I use the over rather than frac. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about frac actually, but this, this seems to work. And you have to put curly braces just to make sure because otherwise it will get formatted. Mm -hmm. It'll get confused by the precedence. So what this does is it kind of works backwards. Yeah. So one over first coefficient, or rather the the first coefficient is here. So first coefficient, add the rest, and the rest comes from here. So second coefficient over remainder, over the remainder. So calling this nested format function. So second coefficient over the remainder, they do that and then plus one. So that one will do a LaTeX, output LaTeX format. You see how I just put it in dollar signs and use this LaTeX function and Jupyter will do the rest very nicely. And this one actually does numerical evaluation. So what I do first of all is I assume that the coefficients, number of coefficients is odd. Uh, I just stick a one on the end if there isn't one. And so second last, no, yeah, third from last, divide by that and then add the one before and then kind of work my way. What I'm doing is I'm working my way from the smallest part, working my way up from there and up from there up to the final answer. So, um, so here, just for fun, is that uh, 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 plus 1, 20 turns. Oops, one minute. Oops I forgot to run this. Let me run this. Let me run this code. Run that. Run that. Run that. And then I'll run that. Ah, there we go. Okay. So you see? So I can ask for however many I want. And it will and it will give that number. So of course it's only an approximation to the one. Now what I did down here, let me start by just showing you. Let's say I ask for if I evaluate to the same number of terms. So you see this is a list one repeated 20 times, right? Standard Python thing. You multiply a list by an integer and it repeats the list. And you look at this and you see it's actually pretty terrible. It's only about four figures. Or well, not even four figures. Mm -hmm. So when I increase that, 100 figures, 1.6780, okay, it gets about that far. It gets about that far. You know, so in my notebook version, I had 300 figures. You know, and then here, so I just, this is exact, or rather to full precision in, in decimal. And you can see, where does it get different? It's very good up to here, 834. This is actually good enough. Yeah, so 300 turns is necessary in the continued fraction just to get 64 digits. So, yeah, yeah. so the convergence is pretty slow. So, and then uh, another fun one is computing pi. Pi is the number One everybody wants. So, yes, so uh, continued fraction. Oh, no, no, okay. So at math world, at math world, where's the pi? Ah, okay. So math world has a whole lot of pages on continued fractions. But it's mathworld.bullframe.com. So here's an opening, but in particular, this one, pi. So there is a series here represented by that. But what I was interested in was the ones where the series are. Ah, here we go. So here we have this one. Let's make that larger. So can you see the series of that? Whoops, what am I doing here? Uh, let me go. Hmm. So can you see what that one? It's one plus one squared, or two plus three squared, two plus five squared, two squared. So these are all twos and these are all odd squares. So that gives you four pi. So if I put four over this thing on the right-hand side, that would give me pi, right? So that's what I do. So down here, so, uh, the, so I write a generator, and you notice this generator doesn't terminate. So first of all, uh, I yield in the terms of the sequence. Look at this. If I put four over that side, I'll show you what it looks like. So first of all, to to generate to actually print out part of this list, 
I was too lazy to write a function with a termination in it. So it's just an infinite series. So how can I generate a list from an infinite series? And it just so happens intertools is a function for doing that. So let me do that. So first of all, I define the function and I import intertools and then I'll show you what I mean. So intertools is a function called I slice. And there we go. That's the first 25 terms of the series. So 0 plus 4 over 1 plus 1 over 2 plus over 9 over 2, right? That's your 3 squared. There's your 5 squared. There's your 7 squared. If you want to know what it looks like. So this is how I print it out. And if you look at this, you see what I mean? So this is the, if we, if we cut that bit from there, right? So this part matches up with this whole formula, right? So four over that, so the four over that, and then because my functions all expect an adding term to self, put it just put a zero in front, okay? And then again, so now if I try evaluating this, okay, let me reduce that. Um, you'll notice like a lot of terms in it because what I found is again, it's quite, it's quite terrible. 3.12, now everybody knows that's not 3.14, you're expecting pi, right? So if I add like a thousand terms, so if I do yeah, thousand terms, three point one three nine. Still, it's only three point one four. It's still you know, so it's it's still pretty terrible. So originally you saw my notebook had hundred thousand terms in it, and hundred thousand terms is first of all, that's the floating point. So that's only 15 figures, but that's already better. 65358. Huh? 653, and that's where it stops. Yeah, 315. Yeah, 6535. Five. So that's terrible. No, no. Yeah, you're going to compare those two? 1415, that's it, and it stops. Yeah, 157. Okay, right. So 157. It's only been 159. Yeah, yeah. It, it has the similar ones later on. It's a little bit confusing, yeah. So even 100,000 terms. It's only four decimal points. Mm, not wonderful at all. So just for fun, the, this Python's decimal page has a formula for pi, <laughs> has a function that does pi, and it does a spectacularly good job, much better than minimum fraction. So here's my version of the function. I'll leave you to look up there. So here's my, mine is actually a little bit tidier written the example. I think they didn't, like you see, okay, here's some fun. See, there is a thing called a, a context so in the decimal module, the context defines the global settings for all decimal computations. So what they did in here, I'll show you what they did in here. Where's the pi function? Pi, ah, here's the pi function. Now you'll see what they do is they temporarily increase the precision by two and then decrement it by two. So the example, so a context can be a context manager, but they don't use it in their own example. So you see, I did. So I create a new context. And then I, so you know how context managers work. They can let you temporarily allocate something, set something, and then no matter what happens in that code, once it comes out, it will clean up. That's guaranteed, even if there's an exception. That's a nice thing. Nice thing, and, and they didn't use it. So I create a new temporary context, which, which by default is initialized to the previous context. That's a local context as it creates a new one, it but it gives us. Really, really old. To be, yeah. So I do what they do. I increase the precision by two, but I don't need to decrement it because it'll just go back to the old context. And I did a few other things to simplify this. So this is the only explicit use of decimal in the whole function. Notice everything else is just integers, but because soon as it, even this, See this expression here, just the fact that one operand is a decimal in there somewhere, the whole thing turns decimal. And I get the full 66 figures now, right? 64 originally, now 66. So when I run that, there we go. So that can be trusted right to the last digit. That is 64 figures. And I did it in 104 steps. Wow. 104 steps versus 100,000. And you know only a few. Only a few digits. So this is... You know, that's, and you see, pretty and you see that's pretty amazing. So 
you know, uh, I was getting a bit disillusioned with continued fractions at this point. And then, uh, okay, okay, I'll try another formula. So there was another formula on the Wolfram page, which is this one is pi over two. Yeah, see, pi over two. So just change that to a two and change that to a two and you'll get pi, right? So here's my, uh, another generator function. And here we go. So, so you see a two and minus two instead of one and minus one. One and minus one, three. Three minus two times three, one minus one times two, three minus four times so three, one, three. These all go three, one, three, one, three, one. These go two, three, one, two, four, five, three, four, six, seven, five, six. And you can see that here. So three, one, three, one. And that's two times, minus two times three, minus one times two, minus four times five. And if we display that, so there we go. There we go. That's what it looks like. So, Okay, so we got the two and the one, so that should be pi as well. And you probably won't be surprised to discover that even a hundred thousand terms of that is not particularly wonderful. It's not particularly wonderful. However, however, so okay, right up the top, there's this odd looking one here. So this one is uh, this one up here. It looks kind of weird. There's no sequence to it. So I just thought I'd try the ones that they gave, right? So I pulled out those numbers. That's what that looks like. And if I evaluate that, so okay, so wow. this is actually good to 10 figures, but two problems. Count up how many digits there are in here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. There's 12 digits to produce 10. And there's no pattern to it. The only way you can determine the sequence is you already know what pi is mm -hmm. and you're working backwards, mm -hmm. you know? So I looked at this whole thing and I thought, what's the point of continuing fractions? And as far as I know, it's really just a mathematical curiosity. If you're really going to be doing numeric work, I can't see any point of the damn thing. <laughs> 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 you know? So that, that was my conclusion. But it's because, you know, I come, I come across it frequently. I'm frequently coming here. You know, this can be expressed as continued fraction, or mathematicians obviously love the things. Mm. But, uh, I guess it's a thing you either love it or not. Mathematicians, they get fascinated by all kinds of things. They don't yeah, care. It's, it's kind of neat. Yeah. You know, we you have a pattern that approaches, they yeah. can prove that approaches. And as a mathematician, you don't care if it's a million or a billion or anything. Yeah, that's, that's right. The only finite number, number of atoms in resources. Are the only finite number of atoms in the universe, even if it uses them all, it still counts as finite. Yeah. yeah. And we so. have more available. Mm. <laughs> Eventually, by that time. So there we go. That was what I found. So the, the decimal module is very handy, and there are lots of better algorithms that will work with it. That will work with it. You know, so uh, the decimal module is fun. This one, excuse me. So uh, if you want to do lots of arithmetic like that, Lots of women down there. You, you know, use the decimal module. So that was my little talk. Cool. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. <laughs> right. So, I mean, tonight we've talked about integers, real numbers, and I'm sorry I have to make it slightly more complex, pun intended. Um, and um, so just Fractal sort of like as a thing sort of like yeah back in the 90s that really sort of like became more popular and you probably still have come across all kinds of uh, funny or interesting looking pictures. Um, just as a quick refresher for complex numbers, um, they consist of two parts, the real part which is sort of like usually depicted on the x-axis and the imaginary part which is on the y-axis. And over here, you can see sort of like usually they are rather than using X or Y, they have been depicted as Z equals A plus B and I. I is basically just the notes that's the imaginary part. Yes, that's so rather than just having sort of like with a usual function, then you have rather than taking from X axis and you plot it onto a, uh, into a, a plane, you already have numbers that are in a plane. And uh, one interesting thing is. Um, if you take the square of i, um, you get minus one. 
Um, and yeah, that's sort of like the interesting part about it. Um, and yeah, so you basically have, if you have a function, you basically have a four dimensional, I believe, space, because you already have two um, input variables and then you get two more out and it's basically four dimensional. This is a little bit hard to imagine and I guess that's why it's imaginary. Um, but it's, um, don't worry too much about it. Um, the nice thing about Python is it has built in support for complex numbers. Um, so you can basically write a number um, just like mathematically, rather than using I, they're using J. Um, so A plus, sort of like one plus one J would be automatically a complex number, or you can then also use um, the method complex and put basically your tuple in there to make that a complex number. Coming back to the fractals, so um, Benoit B. Mandelbrot was, um, he's Polish-born, French-American sort of like Benoit, mathematician. Benoit, Benoit yeah. Benoit. Uh, he was a, died in 2010, oh, um, at 84 or 85, I think. Um, so he was very uh, active in the 80s and whatnot, and actually visualizing the whole thing, whereas, see, so he was more on the visualization end of things, and with computers finally becoming a bit more powerful, that stuff could actually be done there rather than just in your minds. Um, he was actually then visualizing a lot of these um, computations and what other mathematicians just thought about what it would converge to. And I mean, it's very hard imagining sort of like a whole big plane uh, when you're usually use, looking only in a single sequence rather than looking at thousands of numbers, what actually then uh, comes up with. And the Mandelbrot set is, is a really, really simple formula. It's really just a simple recur, um, iteration in that sense. So you have Zn plus 1 is derived from the square of Zn plus C. And um, you start out with Z0 as 0. And from the, um, so that's um, also from a complex number. And then C is basically just a number that you pick from the complex plane. And you can then um, take basically a dimensions out of the complex plane, like a, um, a rectangular, and then basically pick uh, various C's from there and then compute something and then iterate. And whether a point or a C belongs to the Mandelbrot set, it's really sort of like, does that, through the iterations, does the ZN um, basically always stay lower so the distance from the origin does it always stay below two or at maximum two for all sort of like iterations and if that's the case um, then we accept it as that's part of the Mandelbrot set otherwise it's part of the escape set and um, that we can sort of like color that differently um, so the formula it's really sort of like really really simple um, so we have we're starting out here so that's our um, Z um, as zero. Um, so this is the nice um, way of writing uh, complex numbers in here. Um, we have a maximum number of iterations that we go through. Here we're computing sort of like our next ZN. Um, I know it should have been ZN1, blah, blah, but it's okay. So basically same thing in Python once again, we can just simply uh, compute to the power of two and plus. So we have to do nothing like where we have to treat real imaginary parts separately like you have to do in all kinds of other languages. So it's really nice. It keeps things uh, small and concise. Um, and then we are looking at is the distance basically to the, the um, origin, is it sort of like greater than two? If that's the case, yes, then it escape. And uh, we can also know at which iteration that sort of like happened. And then if not, We'll just keep sort of like, um, this is our new input then for the next iter step of the iteration and keep going. And if it didn't um, escape, then we can say, cool, okay, that's part of the set then. So, it's going to run that. Um, so, if we're using one plus zero plus, uh, sort of like basically one on the um, x axis, cool. So, then you can see it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and that basically escapes that iteration too. If we're looking at two, 
Yep, and that's already basically out at iteration one because the distance is already two. Um, and then if we're looking at zero plus one, J, go through there, then that keeps going and it didn't escape. And if you look closer, you can also see um, that it basically cycles between the same numbers backwards and forwards. This is uh, one of the properties that we can see later on, actually also on the middle board set, that um, they have a cyclic behavior or periodic behavior in there. Um, Angus has just mentioned the uh, shader toy. There's a, uh, I think that's, I think that's OpenGL shaders, is that Angus? So yeah, so he, he's posted a link to a thing on shader toy. Oh, okay. Shader toy is a place where you can run but you changes in my GL. Oh, okay, yeah. And, and do, and we'll do have it. a look later on at that. It's probably going to look way better than mine, so I'm probably just going to go through my talk <laughs> first, and then we can look at some nicer stuff. Yeah. Cool, so that's that's the basics, really, sort of like how you actually run um, the formula. So once again, really simple, really easy to read. Um, just going to pop up. Okay, so... So in this case, we're just defining basically our rectangle from the complex plane. So our x is going to be from minus 2.5 going up to 1.5, so distance of 4. And um, on the y, we're going to go from minus 1.5 to 1.5. So the Mandelbrot set is sort of like um, symmetric around the, the y, uh, x axis. So we're just making it symmetric around that, and that's just like a four by three ratio there. Um, and since I'm outputting that here in the console as a simple test, I'm just sort of like, let's do it 80 by 60 sort of like points. A really small one, um, just sort of like calculating the increment sort of like between the points and um, doing the same thing. So um, here we're basically using the complex um, method of Starting at our calculating our x, so our real part here, and our y part, or the imaginary part, and then basically feed that through. So rather than um, having a hard coded C, we basically just go through our grid that we defined there. So if we run that, I'll have to do it a little bit smaller so it actually fits on the screen. Um, so I'll make it a bit smaller that it might actually. So you can see that there is actually a shape coming up, and you've probably seen that shape before, as the manual board said. And it's just sort of like a simple if it's um, a dot, it means it escaped, and if it's a blank, it didn't escape. And then just going through there. So, really, really simple. And that's sort of like one of the printouts, the early printouts, what it actually was on IBM mainframes. And now we run that sort of like on a commodity laptop, um, which is a lot easier. And probably compu the computation time was a lot quicker on my laptop too. Um, so yeah, not overly fancy. In the early days of the ACOG Archimedes, where the arm chip came from, there because it was the first affordable risk machine, mm. you know. And uh, one of the things they like to do on the arm users, ACOM users like to do was run nanobots. Oh, really? Yeah. And, and the RAM rings around it. Yeah. So that was sort of like a binary one where we saw it's either part of the set or not. And you can see that the points will actually escape at different number of iterations. And so, how about we use still sort of like console output? But how about we sort of like do a model or 10 of the iteration and then use that as a number so we can maybe see a pattern of when things are escaping. So if we're running that then, so you can see that we have these ones, the zeros are already sort of like too large and then we have R after one iteration, after two, uh, after three, four, five, and the closer you basically get to the boundary, the more sort of like iterations it will take um, to get there. Um, and we'll turn it later on into pictures as well, don't worry. So it was just a thought, sort of like a neat way of um, going through 
as an ASCII style approach. And you can see there is sort of like a certain patterns that you can see um, to it. And then we can then turn that uh, and do that now as images. So I'm using here um, basically NumPy um, for creating sort of like my placeholder matrix. Uh, number of points, sort of like for my matrix where I'm going to store the results in. And what I'm going to store in there is simply whether it's escaped or not. So I'm going back to like a binary setup. So by default, everything's zero, um, using sort of like initializing of zero. And if something's there, I'm going to bunk 255 in there to turn it into a sort of like black and white image. Um, and so anything that is the set will be um, black only if it escapes, gets uh, turned into white. And then I can turn that into a pillow image, um, bung that into a bytes buffer, um, and then basically use a um, sort of like from IPython an image, and that basically gets nicely um, displayed in line then. So I can run that one then. And then you get that. And it's a slightly higher resolution than previously um, with just 80 by 60. Um, still, you can see you can see sort of like, yeah, those little nodules that are sitting on smaller ones, and then there's other little sort of like dots throughout there. Um, of course, Jupyter Notebook doesn't really sort of like do the zooming in here. Um, I mean, what I'm not exploiting here is the symmetry either. So I basically compute everything. I could only just compute half of it to speed things up a little bit. Um, and you can see actually up here front, there's sort of like another one, little shape. Um, and then we can go and make that a little bit more fancy. And we're using sort of like 16 gray values. Um, if something's, if a point escaped and like if it didn't, just to see uh, what that then actually looks like. Run that again, and then you're actually getting a much nicer image, and you can see certain patterns there, sort of like here, you see this around here, sort of like the radius, um, sort of like around the origin of uh, with radius two, a circle of radius two, um, and then you get sort of like, you can see how it becomes closer and closer aligned basically to the shape. And I mean, the funny thing about the Mandelbrot set is that um, the boundary between escaping set and um, the Mandelbrot set itself is a line, but it actually approaches, as far as I know, dimension two. So it's actually an it's area. between one and two. Yeah. There's a thing called the Hausdorff dimension. Yeah. Do you know what the Hausdorff dimension is of line? I thought it was getting close to two. Close to two. It won't be two. No, no, it's not two, but it's it's it getting there. I mean, that's that's the interesting thing with borders, sort of like um, one example that actually I think Benoit uh, always mentioned was that Spain and Portugal always report the length of their border differently. Yeah, yeah. Spain, being a large country, sort of like takes a big ruler around, and Portugal, being smaller, takes a smaller ruler, and they come up with a larger sort of like yeah. borderline because it depends on the squiggly line, sort of like do you sort of like just average out or um, do you take every little rock and then count that one? One question, that little dip is a thing. Does that repeat anyway? Sorry, which dip? This one? The, the little, the cardioid shape. I was going to say bum shape, but the cardioid shape, the big, the little, yeah, in there. This one. Does that shape repeat anywhere else? Um, because you get shapes with repeating within shapes, but does that little... I think that's the problem with the symmetry. Nothing else is symmetric. Oh, okay. I think that's a special case there. Okay. okay. Yeah. But yeah, you can see sort of like, yeah. And, and the interesting thing is sort of like with the, um, we can go on the period thing sort of. Um, so there is actually an ex a behavior in here. So you can see, um, oops. Any point 
in here will have a period of one it basically sort of like will end up there over here so you have sort of like two four eight sixteen you have sort of like a doubling going to sort of like to the left whenever you go sort of like into next adjoining adjoining sort of like basin and then um sort of like if you go from the largest to the next smaller one you get basically one two three um that's the next small four and then here you get a five so if they sort of like always between two of them if you get the next largest one you always sort of like then go up and whatnot so you have three four and then five and then over here six seven and going in sort of like that goes up with a period and each one has its own doublet series yes and then you have three six nine if you're sort of like going up here and then here you would have five ten fifteen and so on is it not five ten twenty oh sorry um three six twelve Double. I think sorry. Um, no, not doubling. I think it's doubling. Um, it's a good question. I think it's doubling. Three, six, twelve, five, ten, twenty. Um, or it could be just, or maybe um, it's been a long time. I actually yeah. did that back in high school, so it's uh, uh, nearly thirty years ago. Um, so it's a good question. It could be just that this is the factor that it goes one, three, six, nine, and the other one would be five, five ten, fifteen, and so on. Then um, it would be two, four, eight, and two, four, yeah, six. Yeah, it could be two, four, six, then. Yeah. Can't really see that there. Anyway, so I thought, okay, cool, I'll do that. Um, and then sort of like just look basically using hash sets. Um, have I seen a point before? And cool, if I've seen it, okay, let's look sort of like, okay, now I'll start with the first set and now just um, look at how many points we get sort of like in that new set because it might take a time a little bit of time before it actually ends up sort of like in your periodic cycle and then sort of like that's why i'm sort of like doing here sort of like i have one set where i just check have i seen this point before once i've seen the point oh cool okay then i check sort of like okay is it in my sort of like pe period set yes or no if yes um then cool i've detected a period and then i sort of like what the length is and then otherwise i'll just add it to it and then just do the same thing um so i can then sort of like oops i might want to run that so okay cool so i can iterate so yeah so you can see that escape the iteration um let's try that one oops that one escaped as well and that one didn't escape um, and that has a period of two. So that sort of like is between this minus one plus J or in, or in minus J that it basically um, it sort of like cycles through. Um, if I look at zero, well, yeah, I mean, it has basically a length of one because it's just zero that it stays in. There's nothing much, not very exciting. And that one, which it goes forever that actually escapes them. So. Cool. So I thought, all right, cool. Um, let's write another little thing. And um, okay. So I thought, okay, let's do some SKR. But instead of what I was expecting, just to see once, in the main sort of like basin and then twos over here there are ones in there and there are twos but there's also kinds of all kinds of other things in there and i said oh, that's, that's not great okay okay um let's let's up the resolution a little bit um let's create an image um, and see what that does and just sort of like using um grayscale again and then this doesn't look too great either because mm -hmm. i was actually expecting a single color in each basin and then just sort of like changing color there and i have a suspicion that must be probably with the sensitivity to where you have rounding issues oh. um and then that's one thing that they found out early on that these complex systems are very very sensitive sometimes to very small changes and then that's also where then sort of like the butterfly effect came from. Um, but actually, the interesting thing was that I was actually reading not a few weeks ago that 
migrating insects can actually cause thunderstorms because their wings, when they're actually large locusts, uh, sort of like clouds, um, create so much static energy that they actually influence the weather. So nature actually is aware of that, that they can cause um, these things. But it's, model, you know, yeah, well, yeah, but it's sort of like the sensitivity. It just needs to sort of like um, tilt it a little bit towards one thing. Power, you know, yeah. yeah, so I was a little bit disappointed that I didn't see that is the expected one, so, but I presume you can actually prove that rather than running it numerically, so. Right, decimal. Well, okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure whether, because when, when you saw, I thought, oh yeah, I didn't have enough time to see whether I can then sort of like go with decimal and have arbitrary sort of like um, I don't think this complex here to make it one complex. Yeah, well, well I mean, you can, I can go back to the old days sort of like and just yeah. split things up with the computation. It doesn't matter from that point of view. Um, whether you can sort of like make that better or whether it's still, whether you just push it a little bit further out, the problem, and then you might sort of like clear the center, but then towards the edges where you actually get to the boundary that you actually then generate problems. Anyway, so that's the Mandelbrot set. There's a closely related um, other um, oh, yeah. fractals called the Julia sets, after, um, which were named after Gaston Julia. Um, a French mathematician who was recovering um, in hospital after serving in World War One, and that's when he came up with it. So pretty much the same formula. So you still have um, z squared plus c, but rather than starting with um, z zero as zero, you actually take now that from the complex plane, and you keep C fixed to a particular value. And the interesting relationship to the Mandelbrot set is that if you take the C from inside the Mandelbrot set itself, so out of a basin and whatnot, then that Julia set actually has an inner part. So it has actually uh, in the inner basins as well. If you take it from the boundary between escaping set and the uh, Mandelbrot set itself, then what it's called a dendrite, sort of like basically just one point wide, sort of like, um, sort of like, yeah, branch-like structure. And if you take it from outside the Mandelbrot set, then it, it, you basically have only a dust set, sort of like point, so not connected points, and it's called a Fatou dust, apparently. So Fatou was another, I think, French mathematician who also sort of like came across the same thing. So quite often, um, these are also sort of like, um, yeah, Gaston, Julia, and Fatou uh, sort of like contributed, attributed both of them these. You're, you're saying this was around the 1910s, recovering from 19, the I think it was 1916, 17, when he was in hospital. But uh, Mandelbrot was like in the 70s. Yeah, yeah, so that was different. So he was doing calculations with that. And then later on, this sort of like relationship between those two, because when, when Mandelbrot was actually in the 80s looking at these quadratic formulas, everyone was laughing at him as there's nothing interesting in those. Move on, everyone's doing higher sort of like polynomial things and whatnot, and not even just complex. No, this is all boring stuff. This is for kids. And then, yeah, he basically, by visualizing these things, he came up with all these interesting properties, whereas before then, people didn't look at it. And I mean, Back then it was still really poo-pooed, sort of like having a computer doing the calculations rather than proving something. I mean, yeah. and I think he kicked it off that you can do actually a lot of things with calculations that you previously couldn't actually look at. So that's actually the interesting thing. And I think that brought a lot of things then together that a lot of things got rediscovered again. Basically, um, like 60, 70 years later, I said, oh, hold on. Somebody else actually proved these. So uh, Gaston actually proved certain things that there was certain convergence happening and, and periodic cycles and all these things. So did Julia, did he know about these divisions into different kinds of Julia sets? No, I think he didn't. He, I'm not quite sure whether he... Probably not. I mean, he couldn't do that. He probably had certain things that he could, may have been able to prove certain things, oh. but that not that... As long as you take points out of this set, you will get this property. 
he was probably able to prove for certain thing for certain specific values of C that a certain behavior will happen, um, but not sort of like what they will actually then look like. So similar thing here, just like a few uh, sort of like points or a little method that now takes sort of like a C as a parameter. Um, our Z is sort of like now being varied um, once again, sort of like a matrix and turning that into um, then a grayscale. I can just return that. So we're starting with the origin again. And yeah, guess what? It gives us a circle. And zero, zero is sort of like out of the first base. And so it's one sort of like shape that you get. Um, if we're moving around the main basin a little bit, so oh yeah, you can see all of a sudden. Um, so if you're moving away from the origin, you can see that the, the border is getting more and more distorted. Um, if you're moving the other way around, you get sort of like a more symmetrical distortion that way. Um, if you go negative, so if you're moving out sort of like on the dendrit, and I think now we are actually um, yes, so we're actually moving over here. I think we're now sort of like in this basin here. Um, and then you can see sort of like, oh, you actually get these subsets now. So you're no longer just one connected basin, but you now have these separate basins that are happening. Um, and if you're sort of like going from the origin up, then this is actually one that sits directly on the boundary at uh, zero plus I. Um, and then you get this sort of like one point sort of like um, dendrite thing there. Um, and then last one, that's outside. And then you get sort of like your point dust where nothing is really collected anymore, uh, connected anymore. So this would have a hostile dimension less than one, I would say. Yes, okay. yeah. This would be one. Is it one? Oh. I think that they will, yeah, so, or close to one at least. Mm -hmm. I think, and then um, I think these ones um, are getting closer to two then. I mean, there will be sort of like, I think this is this is really just the circle. Um, should be exactly community two. circle should be. Yeah. But yeah, so, um, and that's really it. So any, yeah, Angus wanted to have this shader toy. Cool. Hey. So the, the key point, mathematicians didn't really appreciate that if you take simple calculations, then a computer can do them a million times, mm. and now you get a whole new kind of maths, which people simply couldn't do before. Because yeah, yeah, it's just often a whole lot of other things that you could explore then. Yeah. Chaos and fractalness. Oh, that, that was big. I mean, you know, the old, I've got a book from about 1920 of uh, trigonometry. Oh, yeah. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, log tables and all that. Mm. Well, they must have been all done manually. Yeah, yeah. And you know, someone's got to type it correctly and someone's got to check that. The... Yeah, so back then in the days, a computer was a person was computing a person. Yeah. these tables and whatnot, or computing. They had things. machines. Yeah. Computing calculators and things. Yeah. They had other machines. Yeah, tabulators and whatnot. Yeah. There, there, there's a. There's a thing called the freedom calculator. The things like that. Yeah. And for example, to multiply two four-digit numbers, if you do, you know. So if a number was one to three four, then you go to the thousand digit, second digit, two rep, So each one you can't use good enough, and that gives you multiplication. So it's more multiplication, yeah. more division than just like counting panels and all that. But, but even that, just to, you know, to make sure you whoever types it up. I mean, that, yeah. somebody had yeah. to type set the thing yeah. and not, not make a mistake. Or if they did, someone had to have checked it and corrected it. There are many think, hours involved. I think, like Charles Babbage's machine, whether it actually did the typesetting as well, it might have. Yeah, it was Pepsi. It, it was the idea? So his machine was going to set the type? It, it was, yes. Mm, yeah. Because I was well aware of the fact that many of the errors occurred in the transcription. This was the 1840s, mm. a century before, mm. you know, the idea of the electronic computer. So, um, he, he, 
after the failure of his machines, or maybe before he conceived a great hatred of barrel organs. You know, these guys would bust on the streets with their organ. Uh, whether it was some kind of subconscious, <laughs> their mechanisms work, and his ones couldn't. Yeah. Wouldn't be surprised. Oh, sorry. Is that zoomed to us? That's just yeah. zooming in just to sort of like, and you can see here sort of like another Mandelbrot set shape like thing there yeah, again. Yeah. After you can see it zooming in for ages. Some of these videos, what's the world record for zooming? Somebody, I saw a video. Well, I really don't know, but it's, yeah. It is amazing. So, yeah. That's quite cool. Thanks for that, Angus. Um, And you know, so even the Akon Archimedes, you had to wait a few seconds for it to read on the screen. And that was already, yeah, look at that. Just repeat, repeating, but not quite repeating. Yeah, it's always, it just, but that's basically about nature. It's, it's, it's a certain pattern there, but um, it's not always necessarily quite the same. Self similar. Yeah. It's called self similar. Yep. And yeah, this is the whole, the whole fractal. What makes the fractal is the self similarity. A simple formula that basically generates this complex appearance. And this is only 2D. Have you had a brain called mantle bulb? Yeah. That's 3D. And that's, you know, you get vertigo from this. Yes. In 3D, it just yeah. destroys yeah. your mind. It does. Cool. All right. In that case, thanks, Angus. Um, I'll close the um, session then for tonight. Thanks everyone for joining.